Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Hi, it's James Blatch. I'm Jenna Brown. I'm Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writers, Inc. So I am getting ready for Author Nation. Um, I, I'm giving, I don't know if I told you guys this, but I'm giving away a, a hardcover to, to every attendee. Um, so I've been like collaborating with Joe uh, Solaro just to kind of figure out when you know I'd be able to do that and how many I would have to send. But we finally landed on a number. I've got two pallets of books, which is the most I've ever shipped heading, heading to Vegas. Nice. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they get there. Yeah, yeah. Are you gonna have there's to sign a... them all now when when uh, there's a signing? You just have a lineup. I, didn't you volunteer to do that? You're gonna sign on my behalf. Yeah, I'll yeah. do it. I I could I could it's, it. it's, a, it's a very scriggly and any one of you could do my signature. It's real easy. I you should always about the uh, posting thing about posting. Well, yeah, we like we're shipping thing this year because I oh, we've yeah. shipped stuff and I've no clear. So, so allegedly sitting in a warehouse but there's no way of knowing if it's there is there no no have, have you done this shipping yeah. you have to have these certain labels this is a bit this is a bit behind the scenes for author nation but you have to i mean Susie's doing a fantastic job organizing this joe's wife just Sue solari yeah. but she's yeah. she's rightly saying you can only ship stuff to this warehouse and it has to have this label on so we had people doing building banners for us and they said well we can't put labels on it because we just send it to dhl or whatever eventually found a you know new supplier who said yeah we can stick a label on it It has to have this label on it hmm. but i don't know is it there who knows i I, you know. I kind of picture the the warehouse from indiana jones like that's where all of our stuff yeah. is going and yes. yeah if you don't where if you the... don't have that label you're going to end up in the back corner with the ark somewhere and they're never going to find it yeah <laughs> um I, yeah just to give them a shout out i mean they are doing a fantastic job i know this is technically their their first year but like yeah you know, i was talking they, to joe the other day a and, ton like, of work in yeah. yeah, I mean, but everything is spot on. I mean, the marketing, the email, the communication. I mean, they've got it so dialed in. It feels like they've been doing this forever. Yeah, so. superb. Running I circles around me. I can't even keep straight whether or not I'm doing the rave table or, you know, I can't keep any of that straight. I'm going to bring my books by hand because I can't figure out. I'm too dumb to do labels. Have you I'm... read the instructions for bringing stuff by hand? There are set, there's a set of instructions for what there's to instructions. do if you're going to walk into the hotel <laughs> with your own stuff. I'm just telling you, it's uh, all being thought through. I'm going to work it out as I go. You have to walk in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Of course, of course, that's the way it is. So yeah, no, I, well, I may or may not have books at this thing then. <laughs> I'm, I may have I'm a whole actually, lot of books in my hotel room. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a, a detour right before the conference and I'm heading to Florida for one day. So I, I got an email. I, I think I've, I've mentioned a million times. I used to work for a brokerage firm. That was my last real job. Um, I'm going to be 10 years in uh, November as, as a full-time author. So it's been about a decade since I left this place. Um, and I, I've only kept in touch with maybe like two people that that work there. But I, I, I got an email the other day from my old boss. The company's having their 40th uh, anniversary. And they're like, we'd mm. love for you to come. And I'm like, I, I think I could do that. That's going to be almost like returning to the high school reunion after you've done mm. pretty well. You know, yeah. so it's, it's going to be fun. But I, I basically have to fly to Florida, go to this reunion, then fly back home, you know, so to Boston. And I'm here for, you know, like a half a day. And then I have to fly back out again to Vegas. There was no way to adjust my, my flight without like canceling everything. Because I'm one of those guys that never buys insurance. I just buy the flights and figure I'm never going to change it. And like, yeah. that, that's when that's when you need the insurance. And like, I, I never, never have it. Um, and I, I also learned that if you have a round trip ticket and you don't show for like the first part of your flight, they will automatically cancel the second half of your flight. Yeah. Uh, Cause my initial thinking was I'll just book a flight to Florida and fly from Fort Florida to Vegas and then fly back home. And I was told by a million different people, you cannot do that. So yay for security. Hmm. You can do it. You can do it on point to point. So the budget airlines like spirit, they do point to point, but the legacy airlines, the American and Delta and United, they are that's a return trip you don't show for the first one that you've lost that you've lost all the legs yeah well if somebody wants to write a nasty letter i'm willing to sign that but that seems very wrong to me and by the way, yeah. delta is really good if you if you just use their online chat because i got downgraded when they switched uh i think it was our flight to la it was because of the hurricane and i just sent them like a chat email and they refunded me so much money and i was like well that was lovely so i highly recommend their little chat wow. assistant yeah. wow how dare they downgrade you though you know you it's know it was a five-hour flight i don't want to and i ended up sitting next to the bathroom for like five hours and that was not pleasant it's oh. not acceptable you need to be looked after i do you know 
I'm, I'm delicate. Yeah, when I was 19, it would be cool. I'll sit wherever, but I am old now. And I want to be comfortable. <laughs> I can't wait for the Uber of um, airlines, I guess. What is it? Jet, Jet Suite? Jet Suite X? Did you fun. see that uh, they just approved the whole thing where now we can, we're going to get our, our flying taxis? Where... Oh, the pilotless ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, saw that. yeah. yeah. I, mean, I still want to start an adult-only so airline. Close. That's my, my dream in life. <laughs> Naked <laughs> air. What I happens on the Not adult? that kind of adult, Major. just oh, 18 and up. You've got, you've got virgin air, so now you need what? the adult equivalent of that. What do you have against kids? All those big airplanes are terrifying. Screaming on flights is what I have against. <laughs> against. Wow. They're falling out of the sky. Well, well, yeah. The pilotless ones already. No, the big ones. The big one, the, the Boeing. Yeah. Would, at this point, I wouldn't buy an electric toothbrush made by Boeing. So yeah, I'm a little hesitant to terrifying. get on the aircraft I, now. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> I've never been a fan of flying. I think that the whole thing is terrifying from concept to execution it's look just... once you've gotten past your first your first crash everything else is easy. yeah you've had a crash yeah so no unsubscribe <laughs> here's All a right. random bit of a fun fun airline trivia so my wife's father used to work for fedex and he maintained their the airline fleet that was that was his job um the, the actual safest place to sit in the in the airplane is by the bathrooms um, mm -hmm. as silly as it sounds, but it, because it's reinforced for the, the extra structure. Right but there. also you never see an aircraft back into a mountain. No, Just a fact. At the, True. At the back. Yeah, the, 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 the airplane is always what goes flying into oblivion, you know, when things go wrong, at least in the Hollywood version. I don't know. Here's, here's what I know. I'm not doing it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We Kevin, should get to the, the news. news. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so news. first up <laughs> on that note, uh, story confirms that Spotify is paying real money to publishers from publishers marketplace. This is from publishers marketplace. It was bolded. I read it. It's a very Ron Burgundy thing to do. Uh, Spotify's audiobook initiative offering us premium subscribers, 15 hours of audiobook listening monthly has significantly impacted the market, contributing to a 25% growth in the digital audio sector this year with Digital audiobook sales expected to surpass $1 billion in 2024. Spotify could be responsible for adding 10 to 15% to that total, meaning they might pay out between $100 million to $150 million to publishers in the U.S. alone. Of note, Spotify's program serves as a sampling tool rather than replacing traditional audiobook purchases, indicating that it hasn't cannibalized other platforms' sales. Axios reports that Spotify could be paying hundreds of millions globally to audiobook publishers, though the exact data remains vague and the company's influence in the audiobook space continues to grow. Spotify. I, I totally <laughs> called this wrong. I, I didn't even think this 15 hours per month thing would, would fly, but apparently people are buying into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it was going to be a, another version, basically, of the credit system for, for Audible, you know, and that people would just sort of be very blase about it. But apparently it's doing well. Well, it's you can upgrade with... your membership, right? So the 15 hours comes with a normal subscription, but can't you upgrade it to get more audio hours? I thought that's what it was. I don't I don't remember. Yeah, I think you can. That was the point, wasn't it? You got a certain amount free at that level, but then you could buy into it. I mean, I'm being paid for audiobooks. I took mine out of exclusive with ACX last yeah. year. And I didn't make, you know, I only had two books, but the amount I made from them when it was exclusive, I now make up from Spotify and whatever I get from Audible yeah. tied together. And anything else that comes in is a bit of a bonus. So that's it has worked for me. I was surprised. And I don't drive traffic to Spotify, but they do a decent job. Yeah. I have you noticed them I don't get the ACX sales anymore. So obviously, internally, once you're out of exclusive, they don't bother they, driving traffic. They're mad to at you. Yeah. Did you go wide with, with Findaway or one of the other services? I went wide with some of them individually, and then I went with one of the aggregators, but I did a while back. So I did Spotify myself via Findaway. Okay. And obviously, I, it was on ACX, and I may have done one of the uh, others, Chirp or something, but I can't. I, then I used an aggregator. Honestly, I can't remember now. I've done so, so much stuff since then. But, okay, I've still only got three before. books that are that are still exclusive on, on Audible. I think by now I could actually pull them out but they they don't make very much money and uh everything that's gone wide 
you know, I make three, four times what I ever made at Audible that way. So I'm I'm pretty happy with wide. I think I'm going to go all in. I can see how this would work, though, this model, like thinking about it, because a credit you have, like, that's the whole book. You use a credit yeah. on one book. But with the hours, you could, like, dip in for an hour and see if you like the book and then go to a different one. So, um, you know, perhaps for those finicky listeners, it yeah. works better than a credit system. Yeah. That's and it might not point. favor the long books in the way that ACX people liked yeah. the box sets yeah. and the long books because they had their one credit and they were going to get... 40 hours for it with a box set. So with Spotify, yeah. I guess that's less important, isn't it? You could just, pick that's, up that's the... literally what they were going for. They wanted to break that, that cycle. And they're, they're really, I've talked to some folks internally at Spotify recently and like they're, they want to go all in on short fiction, uh, especially aiming at like air. Uh, they're, they're trying to cut this deal with airlines where you can, as part of your ticket or, or maybe you're a member or whatever, but you can get, audiobooks that are the length of the flight huh. so i'm actually going to record a couple of them for for the trial for that here soon wow and you could be really clever and record one that's specifically for like phoenix to yeah ontario as a story i'm just, about I'm just gonna on do a plane from phoenix to ontario, yeah i'm gonna do like an hour and a half of this plane's going down this plane's crashing <laughs> yeah, i don't think it? they're gonna let you do that one <laughs> in the same way they normally cut the airplane accidents out of the um, streaming films <laughs> i mean i do think i to be fair I, you know, spotify is disruptive and it, we we see that i think one of the good things that's come out of this is that acx are reacting <clears throat> perhaps not as quick as we'd like but we had lee jarrett at um at our conference in the summer who looks after acx and he's a really positive guy i know he's he's probably thinking the same as us that it's not quite as fast as he'd like it to be even on the inside but things are happening there's going to be a better deal for authors it's going to be a more flexible service in the future. So that's a that's a, you know a, that's what disruption does to the industry. And I do think ACX is still a very very good platform and a good place to start. Yeah. Um, if not, be all in on. But um, but yeah. So there's, there's benefits. But Spotify certainly have have gone all in. They they're the ones going on all in on this. Uh, surprisingly so actually. Yeah. All right. Next up, uh, say it ain't so is is how i'm going to start this one because john grisham poached material for new book media outlets say john grisham more accustomed to ripping stories from the headlines than making headlines himself has come under fire from the new york times and and pro publica for allegedly poaching their reporting for his latest book framed a non-fiction collection about wrongful convictions the Times says Grisham, the Grisham, that grisham's book draws com comprehensively and without appropriate attribution from Blood Will Tell, a two-part series written by prominent criminal justice reporter Pamela Koloff in 2018. Koloff, who works jointly for the Times and ProBoblica, reported on the disputed conviction of Joe Byron, who was found guilty of his wife's 1985 murder, despite evidence suggesting he was 120 miles away when it took place. No legal action has been reported at this time, but both the New York Times and ProPublica told the Washington Post that they have requested changes be made to Framed to better credit Koloff's work. Framed was published by PRH imprint Doubleday, and ProPublica has indicated it is in, it is in conversation with the publisher about how to correct what is generously described as a concerning oversight. We got a lot of plagiarism in the news right now. I always this feel makes so me feel like I about I, these, you know. Yeah, it, it makes me think I don't want to do nonfiction. Like everybody, like, like I talked to Patterson about it after he had the um, um, uh, what was the guy with the island that got in so much trouble? Epstein. Um, Epstein. 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 Yeah, yeah. So he he wrote he wrote that book. You know, they did the Netflix series, and then like lawsuits came out, and like they all they all named them. And like meanwhile, you know, he did a lot of good. He, he played a big part in putting this guy away. Um, yeah. But, you know, now now he's he's defending it. And now you got John Grisham out there who's basically just trying to draw attention to people that, you know, are, are basically wrongly convicted or wrongly accused. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and now they're they're blowing back on him. And, you know, we, we haven't heard both sides of this. I mean, it's very possible Grisham used many of the same sources that the New York Times reporter used. Um, you know, there's there's only so many things you can go to for something like this. Um, yeah. But that's the know, question is, is what what counts as a source? If you. You know, you research yeah. reading newspaper articles, right? Yeah. That's where you get your primary information because they reported from the court at the time and there's not many people who can give you that level of information. So you use that, but then they say, well, hang on. I mean, I, it's it's a gray area. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not saying that he plagiarized anything. So no, I, it's just I saying he didn't earlier. attribute yeah. it properly. Yeah. Or I that's don't a know. big difference. I'm kind of yeah. wondering, like, how do you even justify going after this if he's just drawing from you as a source? That doesn't make any sense to me. That'd be yeah. like, you know, well, coming from Wikipedia academia, right? You. Like, you always got your wrist slap if you didn't like attribute your source in a paper. So I'm sure what it's probably going to be is just like attribute your source I, citation yeah, yeah do your citations i don't think it's as big a deal it's kind of a splashy headline and it just yeah. kind of feels like that to me like a splashy headline it's and after a gotcha i read this i kind of went well eh, known. like yeah, is this yeah. really a big deal i don't know yeah yeah my name does that it's always very small print attribution at the bottom of the page it needs to do the absolute tiniest point they can do that's out of spite five point font yeah. five point <laughs> In my uh, in my JD Barker expose, uh, I'm yeah. citing all my sources. I'm making sure everyone knows exactly give, where I got my details. Give give proper credit. That's all I care about. Proper yeah. credit. Make, make sure you name the right doing? people. <laughs> all right. Uh, final story. Uh, Amazon unveils first color Kindle and new Kindle Scribe with the ability to write directly in books. Because we didn't have the ability to write directly in books before now. Uh, the Kindle oh, Color Soft. New, Kevin. This is brand new technology. Uh, the Kindle Soft, the Kindle Color Soft, Amazon's first color Kindle, say that three times real fast, uh, will be available on October 30th for $279. It offers a seven inch color display, enabling users to view book covers, interior pictures, and highlights in color. This move comes after competitors like Kobo and Onyx released Color E Ink devices. Amazon also announced the second generation Kindle Scribe with enhanced features for writing directly in ebooks. See, we clarified it. Uh, this update called Active Canvas allows users to take notes that integrate seamlessly with the text, maintaining position even as the layout changes. The new Scribe starts at $399 and ships on December 4th. Kindle Scribe will introduce a feature to summarize handwritten notes using AI and extended margin, which allows notes to be written in a side panel. These updates will also be available for the original Kindle Scribe through software upgrades. I, love I want a Kindle color Scribe. one, but I'm, I'm not sure why. Like I, I don't necessarily I don't, need I'm a like, color Kindle. Wasn't there a fire or that was not a Kindle. That was just like an yeah. Amazon tablet, it was a tablet or something. Tablet. Yeah. Yeah. And it was marketed as a a Kindle. Yeah. yeah. I remember thinking, well, I had, you know, I had my paperwork, what it was called, which I loved. It was revolutionary for me getting the Kindle. I read so much more, primarily because you can read at night in bed without disturbing yeah. Yeah. all the many people who share my bed. Um, but <laughs> then the, f the fire came out. I and, appreciate it, James. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, color version. But it was awful for it. It, yeah. it kind of was defeated the object of, of the yeah. reading well, experience you got with paperwork. It was the screen, like the electronic screen versus the Kindle has, you know, like that, like um, that paper feel. E it's, well, it's almost burnt on. It's like lighting, fibers or something. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's more like an iPad than like a Kindle. I never had a yeah. fire, so I don't know. I do have a scribe, so I'm very excited that I can now can write you... directly in a book. Well, <laughs> here, here's a question, because like I've been eyeing the remarkable forever, um, but as a writing tool. You know, I, I I could read ebooks on it, but I'm I'm kind of interested in it as a portable writing tool. Can you do that? Like, can you pair a yeah. Bluetooth keyboard with the scribe? Oh, I don't know if you can do the Bluetooth, but it has like the pencil, and you can like do the journaling and all that stuff. I okay, so there I... is a way to 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 write something to yeah. create something on it. Okay. Yeah, it comes with a pen. Um, that's pretty. I mean, it feels like it's got like kind of um like a scratchiness to it. So it kind of yeah. feels yeah. more like, like there's like the texture, texture of yeah. writing on paper. And um, I never thought about adding a keyboard to it, yeah. but, um, and I mean, that you can also pull up a, a you must be able to, cause it has like a type, like a, um, a keyboard, an electronic keyboard in it. Yeah. If you yeah. don't want to use the pen. Yeah. I guess you could just put in like a blank word doc with 10 blank pages and write in it. If you just wanted to write in Interesting. it. Interesting. There's a workaround. Well, it has like a journal thing and you can create, you know, files so that you can, yeah. you can do whatever you want. I, I like it. And you I, can write in PDFs now. I'm really excited for the update to write in books, but yeah. I like it for beta reading because you can just upload the document and make notes right there and it, then it transcribes it for you. 
Yeah, this is just another right. example of, you know, I want to use case that that is not common to everyone. Like, I just want to be able to use the thing in a different way than it's intended. So <laughs> got to be special. All yeah. right. JD, who is up this week? This week, we've got Nick Cutter back on. He's the author of some of my favorite horror novels, The Troop, The Deep, and The Handyman Method. His latest is called The Queen and releases October 29th. Here he is, Nick Cutter. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited uh, to talk to you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, so um, I know that you write under both your real name and your pen name. Um, but we were actually just talking about this um, on the podcast about sort of, especially because, you know, if you Google your name, it's not a secret necessarily no. <laughs> that you write under both. Um, I was just curious, um, you know, why you write under both Craig Davidson and Nick Cutter? Like what went behind that decision? <clears throat> um, it was quite a while ago that um, we sort of came to that decision. So um, the first Cutter book came out, I think it was 2014. So like a full decade ago now. And it's not that I wouldn't say publishing is all that much different now than it was back then. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's mostly similarities, at least in terms of this decision. Um, my agent, and I'm not throwing him under the bus on this. It was a mutual decision. We both okay. decided to do right. it, but I think he was the one who first suggested, um, if my memory holds that, um, I don't know, maybe it was something along the lines of like readers shockingly have a hard time holding the idea of um, not to, you know, two diverse kind of trains of narrative or, you know, this person over here writes these types of books um, and then he or she writes these other types of books. And, uh, you know, again, it's almost like there is an assumption within publishing houses that readers have a difficult time with that. So in order to, to clarify that or to stop any confusion on that level, um, let's sort of separate the camps and have um, these books under different names. But <clears throat> I mean, for me, there were a couple of things is that number one, the books that I wrote under my own name, at least at that point, you know, we're not shrinking violets in terms of um, the, the topics that they covered or the, maybe the viscerality of the writing. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a huge difference there between my own work and um, I saw my work, I guess, but, but the work <laughs> on my own name and, and the work is Nick Cutter. Um, so, and, and the second thing is that I grew up reading horror, you know, it was my first love. Um, and, I, you know, I just, I went to school um, to do a, a master's degree and my thesis at the time when I went, they wouldn't, they weren't going to allow me to write a horror book. I just don't think it was probably in the cards academically. And I would like to hope that has changed. I think from a lot of anecdotal um, evidence that I've seen and heard, it has changed. But in the, uh, you know, um, dinosaur days when I went, it was, <laughs> it was not considered um, appropriate to write, you know, a zombie book or something. Um, so <laughs> I wrote uh, you know, a collection of short stories that were rough edged, but were, I guess, considered literary. And they got picked up for publication. And that sort of took me through the first part of my career. Um, but I always had this desire to write a horror book. And, uh, and until a, a kind of an idea really slapped me in the face, I hadn't. Um, yeah, so and then I did, and I'm I'm grateful to do it. But I think the main concern about the pen name was that a lot of people who I know who love horror, just like me, you wouldn't want anyone to think that you're um, like you're slumming it. You know <laughs> right. what I mean? Like like that you you change your name because you were embarrassed or because you didn't want to sully your own name with this kind of um, second rate genre, <laughs> right. material, yeah. which, you know, just is not is simply not the case. So I think that's why, again, when you look online, it's pretty easy to. Um, connect the dots and discover that um, me and Nick are the same person. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think sometimes that I can see in some cases, like if you jump from horror to like romance, for example, I could see the need to have that kind of diverging name, just at least as a signal to your reader. Um, but it is interesting because as you said, you kind of are 
you know, if you Venn diagram your books, they are sort of like a lot of crossover there. So you'd think that your readers wouldn't have a hard time, but I guess now it's done. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would like to hope as things go along for as long as, as my career may um, persist that, um, that, yeah, there, as you said, the Venn diagram seems to get closer and closer in some ways um, in that uh, um, the horror work and the work under my own name sort of, I mean, you are, you're pulling from the same bag of um, obsessions and uh, right. um, fascinations. And so it's maybe not surprising at all that ultimately there is a lot of um, collusion or, you know, sort of mingling and mixing of, of the, of the two names and the, and the sort of fascinations that persist with both books. But, um, but yeah, it, the, you're right. The die is cast at this point and um Frankly, Nick Cutter keeps the lights on around here more so than Fred <laughs> Davidson does. So, so to get eclipsed by your own pen name is also an interesting, um, you know, we're you never know when your career starts where you're going to be, you know, twenty years on. But right. such such is where I find myself. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, so you had mentioned, like, you know, you kind of started writing because you got your um, master's. Um, where did your writing journey start? Like what kind of prompted you to, I guess, decide I'm going to go to school and get a master's and try this thing called writing? Well, you know, I, I guess I, I didn't have to really, you know what I mean? There's plenty of very successful, more successful writers than me. You don't have um, a bunch of word salad behind their, their name. Like, like I ended up getting, um, I, I suppose the idea of of going that route was i thought i'd be around like-minded individuals and to a great degree i was you know people um, the idea of iron sharpening iron i suppose you know but but again i i think sometimes you go and i don't want to besmirch anybody who i went to school with and i certainly don't want to besmirch the idea of like getting a higher education at all um but i probably could have done it I think if you want to do it, do you know what I mean? I think if it's your desire to do it, there are a million different pathways to to doing it. And um, you know, there there is a feeling in in academia, although this might be elsewhere as well, is that um how, how am I trying to say it to be to 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 say it the right way? There's, I guess there's a posture of wanting to be a writer and wanting to be seen as a writer and wanting to be respected and admired as a writer. If this is what you, you know, sort of consider to be an admirable profession or, or one that is, is worthy of like higher minded in intelligence and thought. And it is, I'm sure at that level, but, but there, but there is a lot of, there is a lot of like um, the pose of being a writer instead of the actual like on the ground being a writer, which I've discovered, um, at least in my own experience, is not particularly glamorous, um, <laughs> is not, you know, it's not about waiting under an apple tree for the muse to um, descend to your shoulder and and bless you with an idea sort of a thing. So, uh, so you know, I think in going to those schools, I thought I was going to be around people who were really fixated on writing. And to a degree that I was, um, but, it, but it wasn't everybody. And right. it wasn't probably any more than I would have met had I, you know, joined a writer's circle or something on those levels, like just sort of looked, sought out amongst my own sort of wherever I'd lived at the time mm -hmm. and just looked for like-minded individuals within my own sort of, you know, purview that who I could have found. But I mean, for me specifically, yeah, the idea of, and I guess maybe there was a notion that I, I would teach at some point, but I think I've discovered that it's not really my <laughs> calling and not really, I, there are just so many people who are much better at it than I am. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess it felt like sort of a backup or a fail safe, but mainly it just gave me time to write around people who, um, you know, in the main were consistently interested in the same thing that I was. So in that way, it was really helpful. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I never pursued a master's, but I have always appreciated the structure. Like I, I like a lot of structure and have discovered about myself that, I mean, yes, I can create my own structure and suppose maybe it's a cop out saying I need the external structure, but there is like something very, um, I don't know, in, ingrained in me that I, 
I really enjoyed, um, you know, and you get the proverbial gold star when you're in school, right? Because there's grades. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> so, you do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, it can get be a it. little bit illusory, but but I know exactly what you're saying. I, I always found when I was not in school uh, and and was had a job, to me, that was actually the more, because I mean, it's not that I didn't like any of the jobs that I did. I, I liked I liked a lot of them, but but obviously you're hearing me say jobs, plural, you know, I was sort of like peripatetic from job to job because it was like, as soon as I had an opportunity, whereas I earned enough money that I could quit, um, right. you know, I would give my two weeks notice, you know, and be as generous and gentle if they needed a month, if they needed two months, but it was like, I am now leaving. Um, and just the early parts of my life, um, professional life were, um, a lot, as with a lot of writers, I think you, you're doing, you're doing jobs to sort of make a living while you are grinding as hard as you can to sort of become the thing that you think you want to be. Uh, yeah. so I found that was, um, whereas you're in school, you know, you, you kind of have, you're, you're, you, you, you wake up in the morning and your day is, is open, which is lovely but it's almost an embarrassment of time sometimes. And there's nothing necessarily pushing you to be like, oh, I really want to stop doing this so I can do this other thing. Um, but in any case, whatever works. I mean, as you know, there's a million ways to to become a writer. And, yeah. uh, you know, my journey is mine, yours is yours, but everybody's is, is very different. Yeah, it is. Um, so you've been writing full-time for a while now. Um, what does your typical writing day look like? And has it changed over the years um uh i try and get a thousand words done a day that's sort of my general and it has changed we um, my wife and i have two kids and um you know we just have a life that it revolves around our kids much more than um than it did you know when i was first starting out writing when i was single or then when my my you know, wife and I were dating, you know, there was, there was no time almost that I couldn't sort of set aside to, to write. So, so I've had to really be, you know, there are just some days that kids are homesick or there's a field trip or something, frankly, I'd rather do more than writing. I mean, that's sort of how it's gotten to this point. Um, but on a regular day, such as today, like before we spoke, it's, it's noon now or just afternoon. I knew, I knew we were going to speak and I have another thing after this and it's like, okay, well, I'll get, try and get that I think I got 940 words done today. So nice. 60 Very words excellent. shy of my, of my, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sit up there and sort of just write two more sentences so that I can get, you know, a thousand, but in general, that's a good, I've always thought about it as like, you know, if you write, you know, if you picture a book of being about 80,000 words, if you could write, I mean, including weekends, which I no longer write on the weekends, hardly ever. But if you could write seven days a week, you know, 80 days. So basically less than three months, you could you could write a rough draft of a book. Yeah. Uh, you know, four, four books a year. <laughs> it's, an, it's an astonishing theory. amount. <laughs> if, yeah, theoretically, right? With no edits and and everything that's flying off of your pen is doesn't doesn't need to be fixed or rewritten. Um, but yeah, you know, I I think in general, if you can uh, for me anyways, if I can manage that, um, that seems to be a pace that I can um, that I can work at. Yeah. Do, do you, um, you know, I know everyone always wants to know this. Do you plot out your books or do you just sort of like start with an idea and see where it takes you? How do you structure your actual, um, writing progress? I mean, that's changed over time too. I don't really plot out my books, but, um, I think experience is the best teacher really. So you learn things that don't, that maybe, don't you know like the idea like you give somebody a, a wacky accent on the first page and by the time <laughs> you page 20 you're like oh my god why did i do this you know why did yeah. i give them a cockney accent that now i have to like persist for the next 300 pages which now i just go back and i give them a normal accent to, at the start and just kind of yeah. move through and you realize that's actually easier than trying to kind of keep the farce going so i mean those are things that you learn but um but I mean, I always think that there's no matter what, um, some books you set out, you know that there's going to be sort of landmines. You, you, the task that you set yourself in choosing the character or the narrative path, you know you're going to run into some issues, uh, and you just accept those as a tariff for the book that you're trying to write. And then the others, you know, there's landmines that are studded within the narrative that you don't know until you step on it and it 
you know, it blows a <laughs> hole in your book and you've got to patch it up and, um, and ideally it is fixable. And then, and then you sort of, you, you move over it, uh, and, or, or you say, at least this is good enough until we get to the editorial stage. And then sometimes you get fresh eyes on it and you can, you can work on it again. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't outline anything necessarily, but I'm, I think I'm a lot more conscious about the way that I think of, and kind of the ideas have to mesh before I start. And that's the only reason I've learned that is simply by bitter experience. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I heard someone say that the only way you can really learn how to write a novel is by doing it badly a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's fair advice. <laughs> um, you know, I've read um, a few of your books and uh, I have to say uh, as a very big fan, you manage to capture dread in a way that um, that I think is so unique in that you carry it from the first sentence through every low moment into the really sometimes grotesque <laughs> descriptions. <laughs> sure. um, you know, and and I'm I'm just sort of wondering, you know, as I'm as I was reading your latest, The Queen, I, you know, it was a very fast read, um, which cost me several nights sleep. <laughs> But, you know, there was just that constant sense of things are going very wrong, even when you it, perfectly normal scenes that shouldn't have had that dread. Um, when when do you think you sort of establish that? Is it, you know, again, like you would kind of the editorial process, is it sort of always there and you just lean into that as you draft? You know, I, I, that's a great question. I think probably it comes from being a student of the genre, I guess, you know, student as much as there's plenty of people who have probably read more horror than I have. Obviously there are, um, you know, as a kid, a teenager into my, well, I mean, to this very day, um, there's no genre I've read more thoroughly in, um, in at, or seen more movies, I think in, you know, that being <laughs> probably yeah. an important part of my aesthetic such as it is than <laughs> horror. So I, I think a lot of it, yeah, is is sitting at the feet of your superiors, you know, seeing the I've described it sometimes as, um, you know, how is a mechanic will take an engine apart to see how it works and then put it back together. I think, you know, for me as a writer, there's sort of the, the, I, I really there's a point when you're young where you're reading for pure pleasure. And I think one of the one of the sort of more dispiriting parts, I suppose, of the of the profession is that you start reading in a way that you are like anatomically dissecting, like what's making this work? Do you know what I mean? It's not, yeah. not am I being scared by this or am I being emotionally moved by this? It It is, um, you sort of, it's a displacement where you are, you become an observer of something that you used to be more immersed in and you're, you're looking for how this is actually functioning on a, on a sentence by sentence level. Um, but, but maybe that's ultimately a lot of cr creative ambition and, and endeavor. You, you end up having to do that a little bit and you have to see what's making it work and, and how this thing is ticking. And then by seeing that, um, you know, you're, 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 you're hopefully you're riffing on it in a way that is unique to yourself, um, mm -hmm. and recognizing supposedly that, that the people who you are, you know, admiring and whose work you are now sort of like picking apart, you know, they, they did that same process themselves in, in sort of, and, and some, I, I think some aren't, I think some are just organically um, gifted in that they don't necessarily need that tutelage. They just sort of grasp innately the properties of um, say of dread or whatever it is that they're trying to sort of um, get out of their uh, get out of their books and and instill in the reader. But for me, no, I'd say I'd say a lot of it probably had to do very young, just immersing myself in books and 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 loving them. And then the next stage, as I get older, um, sort of taking them apart, seeing how they worked, and then applying some of those techniques to my own work. While, you know, I think with my, with my work, what I try and do, and I would imagine a lot of writers is you, 
you you make sure the uniqueness comes from your own, you know, using elements of your own life or your own history or your own background and, and those things married to the techniques that you're familiar with, you know, mm -hmm. make it your own, make it your own as much as it can be. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to shift a little bit towards the queen, which by the way, is a fantastic book and everyone who just wants to be completely creeped out for several days <laughs> should absolutely <laughs> read it. <laughs> uh, where did this idea come from? Uh, well, sure. <laughs> Without spoiling anything, because right. I, mean, I could take that in a million different directions. Um, you know, sort of to, to to go back to what I said before is, um, you know, I think what I'm well, what I was interested in a couple things is a when I was a, a teenager, um, I lived in St. Catharines, which is the city that this is set in St. Catharines, Ontario. I live in Toronto now, so it's about an hour and a half down the road sort of between us and buffalo and um there was a serial killer at loose uh named paul bernardo in our city at that time and wow. uh, yeah yeah i mean it was it wasn't a it's a big enough city but he um he murdered two two women um two young girls i and and i was struck by at the time although it doesn't seem to uphold quite as well now. And again, this was 30 years ago. I was 19, 1994, you know, I would have been 18, 19. So it's a great deal of time ago and my own memory about things as time goes on becomes less secure and sure. But I was sure that there were, in that there were two, I thought there was one who came from a, a kind of a wealthy background and she was seen as like this golden girl and there was another who came from a more downtrodden background and was seen as sort of like, oh, the other girl. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the idea, they were both gone. They were both so young that their futures um, were both um, full of promise and hope and uh, all, all the same things, right? But I, I was struck by, in my memory anyway, struck by the, the different memorialization of these two victims. And so that fed into it, uh, for sure. Yeah, very, yeah. That yeah, sense. and then, <laughs> right. And then another thing was um, was just that time, and you probably had it as well, when at the end of high school, you know, you, you've you been friends with people often for your whole life, um, up through elementary, middle school, into high school. And that's the first fork in the road for so many of us, where that right. summer before going away to college or staying at home. Um, and I had that same experience, you know, with people who I truly thought would be in my life forever because there was no time in my life up until then that they hadn't been. Right. And realizing now with the benefit of hindsight, it's like we weren't even fully fledged people yet. You know, we were still <laughs> right. had so much growth to do and our <laughs> life paths had so much flux in them and so much flexibility as to where they might possibly go. And yet still, like they were the closest people in my life. And you made these promises that, you know, it'll be the same. You know, I'll go away or you'll go away. We'll call every day. We'll see mm -hmm. each other on the weekends. It's like it's like no, nothing will be different. And then five years later, you run into them on the streets of your hometown and you're just shocked and appalled and and just really kind of like crestfallen at the distance that might have settled between you between people who just were so close and i think that feels fairly universal um and i think it was really important for me in this book because i was writing so far outside of my my own existence in in certain ways i mean in a having a young narrator a young female narrator is to try and stick as close as I could to things that felt like universal experiences that whether you're, you're a boy or girl or that you would sort of, mm -hmm. you would have these kind of resonances and these feelings. And so, yeah, I mean, there were more things packed into it and obviously some of the more um, uh, lurid parts come from, <laughs> come from different areas of my brain and, uh, and different areas of, I suppose, my obsessions. But I think the most important thing for me with horror is to a attach those more lurid bits to uh, ideally parts that feel more heartfelt because they really are written from a place of um, meaning to me, personal meaning. Because I think really for me writing, um, it's it's that 
communication with another person, a stranger, and trying to reach out and and capture these kind of ideally feelings that we might both share, you know. So so that, that all the other stuff is fun to write. Uh, and, and I have a great deal of joy from them. And I think probably people who read cutter books have a certain expectation that there's some of that there. So I wouldn't want to disappoint, but, um, in terms of the actual more meaningful things, I think those are them. Yeah. I mean, I think that that, um, that was really well done. I mean, like I said, there's this sense of dread. So you, you know, right off the bat, like <laughs> things are about to go right. easy, but you know, there was like this sense the whole time of both knowing, oh, don't do that. No, don't, don't do that. But also understanding like, but I would have done the same thing, you know, like just right. having that real, like almost you know like I guess that's surprising but inevitable that every writer strives for but on that emotional level right like you know it's going to go badly your character knows it's going to go badly and yet they have to do it anyway <laughs> and you know that <laughs> yeah well I mean I think that was one of the things too that was I spoke about those landmines that are that are both known beforehand and one of the known landmines would have been you know I'm writing a, a teenaged girl um, narrator. That's going to be a tough thing to do. I, I couldn't think of any other way to do it. So that was just like, okay, we got to carry through and, and try our best here. But one of the harder parts is, as you said, like why, 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 you know, there are a million ways that a character could go when you're put in these really strange and dreadful situations. And yet the plot demands that you have to keep that character moving in a direction that, that, right. that allows for the new revelations and stuff. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like in a horror movie where, you know, you hear the noise from upstairs and you're like, why are you walking up the stairs? Why walk away from that right. noise? Run out into the road, run away. Um, and yet, you know, it, you know, you sort of recognize the character has to do that at some level and, and it becomes ideally, finding a way emotionally or psychologically to, to keep your character going, you know? Um, and that certainly, um, again, without spoiling anything required a lot of, um, passes on the revision level and just trying to work, hard, work, work your way to find a way to make this make not only, you know, to, to maintain the plot moving forward, but, but so that readers, you know, again, sort of share a little bit of that, why are you doing this? But at the same level, at least there's enough, um, backfilled material that you're like, okay, I, I, you know, you feel honor bound, maybe, um, you know, at a certain point, the events sort of take, take over now, now you're no longer really having any kind of agency in it. And then you've got to find your agency again, and then you have it maybe stolen again. So <laughs> unlike any other book I've written that required a great deal of sort of jury rigging. Uh, but it's one of the, <laughs> I guess the fun parts, uh, um, and you know, my editor was instrumental in that too. So it was kind of, uh, we sort of tag team some of that stuff. Yeah. So again, without going into too much, but I mean, <laughs> how much research did you have to do, um, to, uh, include certain elements, um, in a few of the different storylines, um, and really like get those as horrifyingly detailed as you did. <laughs> I think, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose we could be talking about two or three or four different things, but, um, there, there's a scene or multiple scenes, I guess, but one main scene I feel like in my memory that involves ants. Um, yeah. and, uh, I guess cutter readers know that I'm sort of fascinated by insects and where that obsession comes from. I don't, I can't exactly say, you know, it's, it's funny how being a, an, an author, uh, you know, you sort of think of like Salvador Dali. It's like, what, why, 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 what are all that milking <laughs> clocks? Why are you so interested in that? I'm not even sure if you had an answer for that. You know what I mean? There's certain things where you're just like, well, it just leaps out of my subconscious and it presents itself and it's this weird little jack in the box that I don't really have much, like, I don't know what the inciting incident of that obsession was, but it's buried long ago in my past or maybe my childhood, but clearly it keeps popping up. So I have, I clearly do have an obsession about it, but, um, 
In that particular case, I read this, and I I, re I write about this in my um, my afterward. But I read this book, a story years ago called Lenigan versus the Ants. I think that's how you say it. And it was published in Esquire, like back in the '40s, and it became popular in schools. It became one of the sort of stories that you would read in tenth grade English or something. Mm -hmm. No longer, it's it's like many things. It's it's of its day. Uh, it's dated in terms of its cultural. Um, was just culturally backwards, basically. Yeah. Um, but as an adventure story, if you just want to look at it as a rousing adventure story of this guy trying to protect his plantation against ants, uh, marauding ants that are just going to like level it and also will happily eat anybody or anything in its way as well. So they're not just herbivorous ants there. They'll, they'll eat skin and bone and anything they can get their, their little pincers into. So I read that. And then I remember seeing a, an episode of MacGyver when I was a kid, me and my brother. Basically, it was Lenigan versus the Ants MacGyver stuff. <laughs> right. And uh, this poor hapless, you know, red shirt uh, fell into uh, a, just a seething pit of ants, you know. And I was like, me and my brother that night trying to sleep, just like the every contact of the of the sheet with our body was like that's that's an ant that's an ant our our house is full of ants, uh, you know. So that left an impact. And then, uh, then I just started reading. I, amazingly, ant fiction was quite popular, like in the seventies. I think James Herbert with the rats. He wow. sort of kicked off this, like insects or, or you know, rodents or whatever, just eating their way through societies. And uh, there are a couple <laughs> books there. And H. G. Wells wrote a really interesting short story about the same breed of ants. So. To, to not to put a fine point to it, it's not my um, unique idea. I I was clearly influenced, as I said before, by by things that came before. But I mean, and not to get too long into this because I know we don't have too much time. But you know, <laughs> the main bad character that I had, the the and again, not to spoil anything, but the hardest thing for me was why the hell would he do this? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like what an absurd idea. <laughs> Uh, right. What an absurd, like, kind of quest to put yourself on. And initially he was like, a, and he still has traces of like an Elon Musk guy. Um, he still has that, I think, DNA attached to his character. But I thought, do you remember back when him and Bezos were trying to like get into space first? <laughs> yeah. Two, you know, billionaires trying to get into space. Uh, but Elon, you know, has kept at it clearly. I mean, Jeff right. Bezos seems to couldn't care less anymore, but, but obviously uh, Elon for all of his flaws and there are many likes space exploration. So I thought, Oh, maybe he would want to create a hybrid life form that could survive on another planet. You know, I thought, okay, that, but it just didn't cohere. And then, you know, I, I just thought, frankly, I thought, what is the most absurd trauma that someone could suffer <laughs> as, a, as a child? <laughs> uh the most I ridiculous and almost <laughs> like you know the the and yet you know from doing the research i've done god forbid it has befallen a human being before i mean that right. fate has befallen yeah. a human being at some point so it's it's absurd and yet is still somewhat within the realm of reality and it just felt like a really fun crazy scene to get to write uh, so there it was there, there became sort of his, his inciting incident, I suppose, that set him yeah. on this bizarre journey. Yeah, well, I think that you stuck the landing, um, on that and, and multiple aspects of this book, because I mean, as you just said, yes, like some elements of it are just like, who would even do that? But as you're reading, like, you're not even thinking of like, is this realistic? Like you are just in the story. So <laughs> I'm glad you are. I'm not sure everyone will will share that same uh, <laughs> belief, but but you know, it's again that was another landmine that I kind of knew. It's like what you're just going to have to put your head down and 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 plow through it. You know what I mean? And as long as I'm invested and I'm having fun, then um, hopefully we can we can drag some readers along for the ride. And I'm I'm glad it sounds like like you were one of them. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think you will. Um, well, I know, as you mentioned, we've gone over a little bit, but we do like to close the podcast with one question. Um, we ask every guest, um, what advice would you give to new or aspiring writers? Um, I, I pretty much have the same 
uh, old hobby horse that I bring out, and it's probably the same that you've had some other writers say on this this show. Um, it, you know, it's not going to happen. You got to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, in a in a simple sense, you you can't just wait for. I mean, inspiration, you never know where that's going to come from. I think that is a little ephemeral and it's its out there. And its its sometimes you feel like you've put yourself in the right position emotionally or mentally to, to kind of catch that muse. But but once you've got it, you know, it's its not going to just sort of come, at, you know, bend itself to your will organically. You're probably going to have to sit down and and struggle, really. And, and at some point, um, masochistically, the struggle becomes part of the fun, I think. <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, thank you so much for your time today. No, oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. All right, guys, I want to know about your weird obsessions and how they show up in your books. Kevin, I'd oh, like you to I'm go so first. so glad you asked this question. <laughs> I actually wrote that question down just in case no one would ask it. Uh, and the sad part is I didn't think of an answer ahead of time. Pass. Oh. No. Well, uh, weird. I, 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 you know, the thing. There's certain themes that show up in in almost all of my thrillers. Uh, one of those is uh, being trapped underground. Somehow that ends up. So I must have a bit of a phobia. I do. I am claustrophobic, so I, I apparently have a phobia about that. So I express it on the page frequently, but that's not really. That's not in the spirit of what you're asking, though. Like I don't have a thing with insects showing up all the time or anything like that. Unfortunately. I don't think. Mm. I'll think I about mean, it. you're right. You know, it feels like insects would be perfect. Just throw like some Indiana Jones, but yeah, there you go. Insects. Yeah. yeah. Or, instead of snakes. Yeah. Why did it have to be cockroaches? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been told I've got a problem with rats, and like I didn't realize <laughs> it until somebody pointed it out. But like rats have made an appearance in a, a lot of my books. Um, and the only thing I can think of, and I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but back when I was a kid, my next door neighbor had a barn and we used to play in there all the time. And they had yeah. these giant bales of hay and we would make tunnels um, in the hay. Um, and I was probably six or seven years old when we used to do this. And, and one of the times when we were playing, the tunnel collapsed and I got stuck underneath all these bales of hay. Um, and kids being kids, nobody wanted to get an adult. So I was down there for <laughs> like five or six hours while these guys tried to figure out how to get me out. Um, and I know that created an issue for me with claustrophobia. And at the time, there were mice and rats and stuff also living in that hay, um, which were basically what freaked me out because it was, it was pitch black. And like all I could hear were mice, rats, and then my friends, you know, tried to come up with a way to get God. me out without. That actually without does sound like a nightmare. Yeah, it was, it, you know, and I was a young kid, you know, so like I'm guessing, you know, it probably traumatized me in some way where it just Ooh, you know, yeah. decided to take up permanent residence in the back of my my skull somewhere well, and it it creeps out every once in a while. Great. Now I'm afraid of rats. I already had kind of a thing after watching The my, Secret of Nim. My favorite kid. rat fun fact is that they used to use them, you know, uh, as mm, less torture, more murder, but, you know, in the Middle Ages, put them in a bucket. Oh, yeah. Put them on your that's, stomach and just let yeah. them let them have a nice meal. That's a, a great hours. story. Yeah, I'm glad <laughs> we brought that up. I think rats actually are. I mean, I I once went for a job. I don't know why I went for this job. I was like 16. I went for a job to look after animals at an animal testing laboratory, which was near our house, Ooh. and looking for people. So controversial job. I didn't care. I was like 16. I just went there to work, and they yeah. showed me around the rodent section. They, the mice are unpredictable. Mice are unpredictable. They will bite you. You gotta be careful. Rats are like dogs. They're friendly. They want to be your friend. They make good pets. They all like looking after the rats, which at the time for me was counterintuitive to what we think of rats. Yeah, I think they're getting a bad rap here. They're very rat. sweet. I used to actually work in a rat lab for a few years in college. It's how I paid for co you know some of my college, and uh, yeah, I was there like every day. And they're very sweet, but the ones that we get are not like they're little tiny guys. They're like specially bred. They look like cows. They're like black and white yeah. patched. Uh, we did have one that bit though. We named uh, him killer, but the right. rest of them were right in the head. That one was not right in the head, but okay. I, yeah, no, we like used to feed people. them cocoa puffs. 
Nice. So I used to have breakfast, like give you know a couple of cocoa puffs for the rat, some for me. So the that rats was had their diabetes. High reward treat. Too. Well, that was their high reward <laughs> yeah. treat. Yeah. Also, sunflower seeds were high reward treat. So now you make them I, do I, things, right? <laughs> here's something that that just occurred to me, though. It's like every one of us, ha- as a writer, have had some sort of weird job that you know a really interesting, strange job. And I wonder how common that is to writers, like. You know, are you attra- Are we attracted to the weird jobs yeah. because we're born to well, be writers? I, I don't or know. Did that make us writers? I also mm. worked in a, a downtown Detroit hospital and uh, yeah. was put on inpatient psychiatric as a brand new baby intern. And oh boy, I have some stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> save those for. I'm your sure memoir. they've influenced the fiction in many ways. Yeah, I think probably because you know one of the things I I would assume about a lot of writers is that you know you're not looking necessarily for that corporate structure type of job uh none of the jobs i've had even when i did work for corporations were not typical like you know don't put me in a cubicle i'll shove pencils in my eyes i would rather be in the hay with the rats i would too so i think that there probably is some sort of personality quirk with writers that um we don't probably like the mundane um jd there's your nonfiction book that's the safe <laughs> one to write the, the, the yeah. secret lives of writers the secret yeah. lives of writers yeah there you go <laughs> i didn't get that job by the way so i didn't end up with a weird job i just went oh you didn't oh. i don't know why i didn't get thing. it but i ended up working in a worse place a battery hen farm just picking out the eggs from battery hens and that was disgusting you had to wear masks double up on masks because of the stench mm. and every day there'd be dead chickens in there and and some of the eggs were like em- embryo called the embryo eggs and stuff that was just honestly yeah. that was the that was the stuff of horror movies if you wanted to I, write a scene of somebody in a disturbed place right. in a thriller you'd, you'd have them walk that's like that my nightmare is like you crack an egg and there's an embryo in it it hasn't yeah. happened yet but i'm always afraid that it will i'll, I'll yeah. tell you something don't ever <laughs> there is a video somewhere of a transparent egg yeah. through the yeah. whole process but don't watch it because yeah. you will learn which bit is the chicken and stuff and <laughs> and i accept more, your terms yeah ever more when you you crack an egg into your oh, you'll, when you think oh that's it all right I, there's a podcast being born here i'm gonna have to start <laughs> thinking this through. all right uh moving on from um weird obsessions boy am i glad i asked that <laughs> get that out of the way first <laughs> Yeah. What do you think helps infuse tension or um in Nick's case dread in your writing? Like what what trick do you use to do that? I mean, me personally, I, I tease little things out. Um I think Christine just saw it on a chapter that we just wrote in, in the bathroom um with one of our, our characters. Yeah, we didn't write the scene in the bathroom. I, 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 I have questions. I have <laughs> follow up questions when, on an airplane. <laughs> this is yeah, I've been This is what happens when I do podcasts pre, you know, post coffee after a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the scene, the scene took place in the bathroom, and it's it's a very creepy scene. And we have somebody basically brushing her teeth, and like I kind of foreshadowed a little bit with toothpaste of something that comes a little bit later that ends up basically crawling out of this person. Um, and I, you know, I basically take out just a little tiny sliver of that, just tease it out, and then talk about something else for you know a sentence or two. Um, because that causes the reader to really focus on, hey, did I just read that? And then they kind of brush through the, the other stuff really fast, and it, it picks up the pacing a little bit. Um, if you, if you, you know, it, it's all it all comes down to showing the monster. You know, that's like one of the worst things you can yeah. do. And yeah. The second you show the monster in any movie, any book, it's it's all over. So you you want to tease them with the the shadows and and whatever else you can do. Dance around it. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's kind of what. Um... Nick does a lot in his writing and this one in particular where you kind of know like elements yeah. of what's going on like from the very beginning but you're not a hundred percent sure what exactly it is and just that tease up until yeah. that climax is really well done I'll, t- I'll tell you something I, th- I think actually builds tension um is the you know it's a rhythm thing too but like the the mm. super short even if you can get it to like one word sentences, you start, you know, putting those several in a row and then sort of breaking the, the breaking the larger content with those. Mm-hmm. Like I've found that like the more of that stuff that appears in a book, the more the tension rises for me. Like I, I can kind of 
I can kind of feel my blood pressure going up because it's, it's, it's super quick. And you're in, there's a, I think there's a sort of psychology at work where you think you might have missed something, you know? Right. And yeah. So there's that sort of creeping thing. That's, that's just out of sight feeling. Mm. That's what it feels like to me. If, if the scene is meant to have tension, like if you, if you're setting it up with the rest of your pros, I, I feel like staggering those little bits of, of staccato bursts of, of text can help with, with, building it up i think there's you're basically then mim you're mimicking what the brain does right like when yeah we're, you know in a stressful situation we're yeah. not thinking in complete sentences anymore and everything becomes clipped and, yeah. and short and this this you're moving around yeah. really fast yeah um, so yes yeah, so so you're mimicking that yeah you mimic it on paper now I mean, any know, time, uh, any... of a revision i have to go do to a scene now so thanks for that right, yeah. <laughs> i think anytime you your reader knows more than your main character about something that's happening is obviously is a yes. good trick whether, whether it's the classic you know breaking into a house and rifling through the the drawers upstairs and somebody pulls into the drive and the reader knows that it's the bomb under the table mm -hmm. um that always becomes tense and then you can write a scene where the baddie is going to be caught and yet you know that you, the reader will have will be worried about them being caught just because that's the natural human way of things that they're going to be just get out of there you're going to be caught but they're the baddie they're the serial killer yeah um it's a strange human psychology we become quite tense when we know something that somebody else doesn't yeah i think yeah. another aspect of this too is that the um without giving too much away but in in the queen in particular the the baddie as it were is not there's there's like various levels of what's going on there and so i think that also adds to the dread because yeah you sort of know you're dealing with like teenagers and so i think that adds a a different element right because you don't necessarily want to believe something's going on with a teenager versus like an adult necessarily well there you go that's how you add dread is you write about teenagers yeah <laughs> uh, absolutely they are uh, terrifying I, I slightly lower yeah. than rats in the uh, hierarchy <laughs> that's <Perfect>. right <laughs> teenage rats it's, it's like combine <laughs> them rats. just combine it all all right uh, okay so oh. jd who is up next week Next week, we've got J.T. Ellison coming on. J.T. is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 30 novels. Uh, she also picked up an Emmy for co-hosting a TV show called A Word on Words. Her latest novel is called A Very Bad Place and releases November 1st. J.T. Ellison. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as no new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.